<laughs> and now that was a good uh, scratch off, right? That just <laughs> that just <laughs> happened, which is great. I, uh, hello everybody, um, welcome. I am Maria Manuela Goyanes. I am the artistic director of Woolly Mammoth Theater Company. I am zooming in uh, and on Facebook Live from Washington, DC. Uh, this is the ancestral homeland of the Nacotchtank, whose descendants are the Piscataway people. And I wanna honor that history and the unceded territory of where Woolly Mammoth is located. Um, because frankly, land acknowledgement is the least that we can do for our indigenous people who are still here, um, living among us, with us, with that uh, history. Um, uh, it must be partnered with action and partner and, and real relationship. Um, with our indigenous community in Washington, D.C. So um, we're working on that and I'm looking forward to sharing sort of the, the fruits of those relationships in the future. So thank you and welcome to uh, Woolies Wonderlist. This is our final conversation of this year um, with the uh, amazing Toshi Regan. Um, so, uh, <laughs> hooray! <laughs> Glad you're here. So Woolies Wonderlist is where I uh, get to sit down and chat with some of the folks who inspire us uh, and hear about what's inspiring them. We'll dig into ideas and influences that have shaped their careers and get some unique perspectives from them. Um, and uh, I, uh, as I introduce um, today's incredible artist, if you want to type in the chat where you're joining from, feel free uh, to do so. Um, but I could not be more excited to be spending some time with Toshi. Now, Toshi is a singer, musician, composer, producer, curator, I mean, artist, activist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, frankly, like what is it that you don't do? Even um, uh, the, the quotes uh, from like Vibe Magazine, one hell of a roller coaster ride and like popmatters.com says, you are a treasure waiting to be found. Um, you are a one woman <laughs> celebration of all that is dynamic, progressive and uplifting in American music. You're interested in that. I know, right? I, I know you because, well, first of all, um, I would sneak into your concerts at Joe's Pub when I was working at the public theater. That's right. <laughs> whenever I heard that you were playing, I was like, I'm getting in there, I'm getting in there. And also you have, you always do such a good job of bringing all these amazing people together. It's like a superpower of yours, which is like, <laughs> it is. And I feel like we're gonna be able to get into that a little bit with Parable and the Sower, which is actually um, one of the main reasons why I really wanted to talk to you because uh, we announced um, that we are working with Strathmore Music Center to bring <laughs> your incredible uh, adaptation of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower to um, the DMV area soon enough. When things are safe, when it is safe to gather, that is going to be um, that is going to happen here, and everybody's going to get to see it. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, I wanted to start things off because you know this uh, to acknowledge the moment that we're into. We talked about this, and I just want to acknowledge like what's happening around us that we're having this conversation. So it's been 225 days since we went into quarantine and began working at home. Uh, just yesterday, Amy Coney Barrett was sworn in as the newest Supreme Court justice. We are six days out from an election, arguably certainly the most important election that I've, I've been a part of. And whatever happens next week, the world most certainly will not stop spinning. The pandemic will not be over. We are in a marathon and the stuff that we are doing right now uh, to uplift black and indigenous people of color in particular and center those stories needs to continue. And I know that's something that you care deeply about too. I wanted to know if, um, you know, it's such a heavy question about like, how are you feeling and that acknowledging what's around us. But I'm wondering, let's just talk about this moment and where you're at. Well, I feel good. Um, I feel really good. Um, I'm in the, you know, I'm in a, a place uh, where I can lay my head down tonight. I, I have three beverages. Um, I'm living in abundance and um, I'm in a part of uh, spectacular communities of people. Some are artists and some are people who do other things, but I have friends and I have family. Um, 
you know, I woke up this morning and I could see and I could breathe. And so I think I'm, I feel, I feel grateful for that. Um, I appreciate your question. Um, I appreciate it a lot because it's just, it's, it's just an extraordinary um, happening that we're all a part of. And, um, and I think that the thing that just comes to mind is like, it's a lot of breakups. You know, it's a, it's a lot of, you know, <laughs> it's probably a lot of endings and a lot of breakups. It's like, you know, we can now break, break up with a lot of mythology around, you know, how our country is run. And, um, there, you know, some of our assumptions about, you know, what we can expect from government and, um, and, and, you know, break up with some of our behaviors. Like we've all had to just learn to do different things and, and be a certain way and, you know, break up with people cause you ain't know you was gonna live in one place where you couldn't actually, you know. <laughs> one of my friends, uh, Jana is a, a, a beautiful, um, she's a real estate agent and she told me that, that it was really busy and I was surprised cause I was like, where are people going? <laughs> like it's a pandemic. Oh, people are just breaking up, is that the thing? <laughs> Well, you know, they are, they, yeah, some people are breaking up. <laughs> some people left the city, like, you know, a half a million people left the city. And then, um, and then also people realized like they didn't have a, a apartment for like, you know, the pandemic that like, maybe they had a loft and, and now they need doors that close. Like, so it, a whole bunch of things. I don't know. Um, I'm all right, but it's, it is something else. It is something else. I wanted to, just because I'm looking at that amazing photo, will you tell me what that photo is right behind you? Oh yeah, um, this is a, my, um, my bestie Jacqueline Woodson um, got this for me when we uh, premiered Parable. This was her present to me. And it's Octavia Butler and um, Avery Brooks, the great actor Avery Brooks. And we just look at it and they're like, what is Avery saying to her? <laughs> she has this like little smile on her face. So I, yeah. You've been I imagining what it is that he's saying. I mean, I work with Avery and it, you, it could be anything. He's so spectacular <laughs> and so deep, so. Awesome. How did you actually, speaking of Octavia Butler, how did you first encounter her work? My mom, my mom was reading her and, um, and she, she was like, read this, it's kind of cool. And I read Kindred and then I read everything else as I, as I, I, I got my hands on it. You know, she's like the one I would just be, I'm still up all night, like <laughs> not going to sleep reading her books. It's prophetic, a lot of the stuff, right? She, she I'm curious about what, what made you then decide to actually turn Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents really is in it too, into, into, um, this bigger project, this 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 endeavor that you've been on for now years. Yeah, I mean, we just realized we could sing this book. You know, we started. Um, I refused to read it when it first came out. It scared me, and um, we. But some years later, um, Toni Morrison asked my mom if she would do a teach a, at the uh, Princeton Atelier, which is a a semester long course. Um, you know, from an, an artist who'll come in and teach. And my mom was like, I can't do it um, by myself, but maybe Toshi will split the classes. And I had taught no classes. I was like, I'm a rock and roller. I'm out on the road trying to make my, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to do my thing. I was like 22 or 20, I don't know how old. I was like young, younger. And, um, and then she, uh, and, but I was like teach at Princeton. Like I gotta make everybody jealous in my class who is at college. So. I did that and, and Parable of the Sower was the text. So we just, and mostly what that meant was that you would read the book with the class and talk about it. But the music we chose um, arc the conditions in the book. And that's when we were like, ooh, um, after we taught that class and that's we started reaching out to Octavia, but my mom was too busy really to do it then. Mm -hmm. So it was more like 2006, 2007, where we really got our hands on it and try to make something happen. What was it like actually translating it to the theater or to music from an adapt, like adapting a book? How, how challenging was it? What was the developmental journey like for you? And did, what kind of breakthroughs did you have and what kind of challenges did you have? At the beginning, it was, it was amazing because 
we both read the book separate, you know, we had read it already now a number of times, but then we kind of separated it. And then we wrote down each of us, like what in each chapter really spoke to us. Mm -hmm. And then if we had any ideas, like if there were songs we already knew and we thought they spoke to that condition, we would say that. And then we, we um, you know, kind of merged our worlds. We found our similarities and we found, you know, somebody would think something different, but it would be really important. And then we just started, That's that was the beginning of the libretto process. Oh. And um, yeah, and then we just made this huge document with all of the lyrics of all of the songs that we thought might be a possibility. And we hadn't actually written any original material. This, <laughs> So that was what was scary. <laughs> You know, it was like songs I had already written, songs she had already written, and traditional things. Oh, and then and then you started then you started expanding it. Then we then then we were like, okay, let's go and and you know write some stuff because we wanted to speak this particular things, and we started to to make some um, sense of different characters and like what you know what they might be, and then we wrote some songs and we started to record them. And look at them. And then around 2008, um, I don't know if you knew Gerard Mortier. Um, Gerard, Gerard Mortier, like Google Gerard Mortier, is spectacular. He's, he was called the bad boy of opera in Europe. And he, he directed just a lot of, he, did, he was a very brave and adventurous person. So he's the one that brought Temptation and St. Anthony to the Paris Opera House. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and so this was going to be his first. Um, his first opera at New York City City Opera, oh, and wow. then New York City Opera kind of collapsed, and then yeah. you know it didn't happen. But, but we kept working been, on it. I know I was going to say, but now you've gone all over the world with it. You went to Abu Dhabi, and you know all. <laughs> before we get into all of those places, I want to actually talk about um, just because uh, for viewers that are maybe less familiar with your um, you know music and what it is that you you know your values, how they come through and all of it and everything that you do. Maybe we can talk about actually the intersection of your art and social justice work. So then we can actually then get into the parable path and stuff. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, I, I'm a black person in America and I come from a, a line of people where there just isn't like, we're just not going art and this and this and that. Like we're living our, the path for black people in America is a very, very hard, um, you know, uh, hopefully everybody understands and I don't have to, to say the whole history, but, um, you know, my family, uh, you, you know, it was a singing family and it wasn't that everybody was singers. It's just that um, music occupied a sacred space in, in everything, you know, um, like they just games, um, working, uh, church, uh, prayers. Um, it's a part of how you can execute your journey and your life and um, expand it forward as it was used as a tool in like, you know, this spectacular nonviolent movement, um, Southern freedom movement. And, um, and so I don't do a lot of separating like the categories of things. I don't go like, here's the social justice issue and then here's some music. It's all, it's all in the same container. And even the language of social justice, like I don't even know when that started being said. Like it, it just is that you're people, like you're a human and you live on this land and you have an understanding of, 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 of what you can do and how you should be treated on this land. And the mm -hmm. fact that there's a hierarchical relationship with someone in power who has decided, right? Like you don't, you don't deserve to exist in the container that you know you deserve to exist in mm -hmm. and that they create a system by which to test you over and over again um, so that it's weird. Like it's weird when you actually like are walking around and feeling free. And not only is it weird, but it's almost an insult, an insult to the infrastructure that's running a country. Like how dare you yeah. be happy and joyful? So. Um, all of that is to say is that it's just not, we, ju we just don't, don't come here looking at these issues as if there's something we get to discover and then create about. These issues are actually internalized into our being and we have to deal with them on a daily basis. And definitely um, singing and being a musician is very helpful. 
I just love the, I've always, I told you this already, I just love the way that you approach, you know, the creative process and who it is that you are and how you think about the world and the people and the community, because it is always, I always see sort of Venn diagrams always on top of each other, you know, and it's, it's not, uh, things aren't compartmentalized because like me, you know, as a person, like I am not a compartmentalized person. <laughs> so why would I compartmentalize like, mm. you know, um, all of these different facets of my life? Why not actually allow them to live together, breathe together, um, you know, uh, collide together. Um, and I, so I'm curious about sort of, uh, the community that has actually formed around Parable, because it does speak to what you're talking about. Because you're making you're making music, you're making a theater piece, you're make you know people are coming to see it. But it's also so much of the work is about deeply embedding it in the community around you. Can you talk a little bit about the Parable Path and where? It came yeah, from? sure I can. I mean, I like to do things with lots of people. So like I bake, my bands are big, and they can get bigger, they can get smaller. But um, the, the truth of the matter is Octavia Butler's uh, work has been around, you know, since the 80s. And there's just a whole tribe of people who have found her and have been, you know, creating around her that whole time. And it's multi-generational, you know, like um, I got asked um, when, in one of the countries we were in, like, you know, does like kind of like this, has anybody read her? Like, cause they, they really just didn't know anything about her and I was like yeah every black woman I know is red hair on full of the sword like you know, I mean that's not true but it's it feels like that sometimes but the truth is is that people have read her work and lots of people who read her work actually take a lot of sustenance from it and a lot of creativity from it because even though some of her books are addressing aliens and all of these like really strange situations they're just they're about us and they're yeah. about our conditioning and each of her books has has a path in it and parable if you want to take it it's there and you can find it but in parable there's literally a path in parable we're in 2024 it's absolutely a horrific time horrific time and if you told me in 1997 we would be so close to it i just would have been like there is no way this can happen because people are going to be like we actually like these blue skies. Like we actually like flushing a toilet. Like we actually like sending our kids to school and staying at home or going to our job. We actually like food on the table. We actually like nobody attacking us. Like we like that more than we hate anything else. And so the least we're gonna do is keep an, an, an infrastructure of society that we can function in. And that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. I was like, I could bet on it, but no, you can't. People, people are, are motivated by the strangest things. And I <laughs> tell and me I, about I, it. You just, I'm like, but you could be happy. <laughs> so, oh my God, I can't, I think it'll take us a whole hour. But the point of it is, is that, you know, in this story, it, people who are, are have already been living in the worst of times, you know, and they have they they're upper middle class, and so they were able to kind of like make a functional community. They built a wall around themselves, and you can imagine first it was a gate, and then it was like a gate made of iron, and then it was a gate higher up with barbed wire, and they and then it was a giant gate that had a big lock on it, and then everybody had to have a key, and um. And they, and they functioned, they, they let go of their cars, they let go of their domestic animals, um, mostly vegetarian, they learn how to make bread out of acorn flour, like they, they become a community, whether they like each other or not. And it seems like it's something that would hold and the, 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 the story is really like, it won't, like it's, it can't, you can't hide yourself behind a wall and think it's sustainable. So eventually you got to leave and be on a path into an unknown place. So I was thinking like that path walking in parable is rough y'all. So I was like, we don't have to do that right now. <laughs> like, look, we could walk some paths that we actually know and we could travel in, in multiple ways and, and we could use our resources now. The, the most important thing is to make a commitment to other humans. Mm -hmm. I will not kill you. 
I will not steal from you. I will watch your back. Like these have to be the commitments that you make to one another. Strangers, people live in your building, that person across the street you never talk to. Like it is the only saving grace when the offering of violence comes. Mm -hmm. And that right there made me just never want to do this piece without other people being involved. And so I, I try, I show up and I just basically say, who wants to work with me on a path, a parable path? And um, because of Octavia's works and because of the genius of people in their own communities, knowing what they need and what they want, that is always a very vibrant and amazing experience. And it's continuous. And you're right, it just doesn't, it doesn't stop because the show happens. The show is a belly button that we all kind of sit around to look and see each other and, and witness this work. But the path is the thing. Like, like, I really think Octavia wants us not to kill each other and waste time and ruin the planet. Like she wants us to live together as great citizens and, and, and we don't have to like each other. Like it's not about liking each other. It's about being able to live together. Um, so. Amen. I mean, a amen to that. So, so you've had some success. So you, you know, you went to Abu Dhabi, you've been to, I mean, you've been all over this country with this show. You, you were telling me about the Parable Path in Boston and that community there. Will you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah, Boston is not, um, Boston, I have a web, I have, I have a website in Boston, um, Parable Path, Boston. Um, there's uh, artist communities or there's an artist uh, group. There's, there's all kinds of things we want to do. I can't even say all of the projects, but we got stopped. Like we were supposed to do the show in Boston in March. Mm -hmm. And then we had planned a bunch of things around that and after that. And then COVID hit. And, uh, and now we're creating um, intentionally through the COVID lens um, our work. And it's very exciting. So very soon you'll start to see these blossomings happen and um, all the way into next spring. I'm very oh, wow. excited about that. And it'll be inclusive of people from other, other communities. So Boston is, um, you know, Boston is really holding up um, and I'll plug one of our vents at the end. A rock and roll. I, yeah, awesome. We're putting, yeah, we just put it in the, in the um, chat, the Parable Path Boston, so, so folks can check it out. What, um, how does it feel about bringing, how do you feel about bringing the show to the DMV, especially after like growing up here? Well, DC is definitely my home and I am so excited to bring it there. It's, it's actually when we first started doing it, it's one of the places that I would get the most emails. Um, we would get the most emails. When are you bringing it to DC? When are you bringing it to DC? The other is Chicago. I don't oh. know. We had to figure out how to, how to get it to Chicago. You haven't gone not. to Chicago yet? No, they're not. Chicago, get it together. <laughs> they are not Chicago. Be I've had I've had um, teachers in different universities try to just do it themselves, and I'm like, no, we need to put something together. So part of the parable path is like fundraising to like really try to support the path, but also support um, communities because I can see a world where there's places where the show needs to go, but it's like we gonna have to do figure out how to do the show there. Um, because it's, you know, as you know, we're a pretty big show. And so it's, it's not, it's not every city or every place that has the, um, you know, has an institutional support to bring a show this size. And in America, it's very like our, our, our theater game is like, you know, can one person come? <laughs> oh, no, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Can, and can you all live in the same house in the same room? And take the tra take the car together and use the same gas. Yeah, uh, it's it's, yeah. Very, it's it's like I'm so grateful to the presenters of Parable because they have really stepped out there with me. I just think they're they're brave and innovative and really wanting to have a particular kind of conversation with their community. So I'm so grateful to everyone who's done this show. Well, great for we're grateful to you for your talent and to putting it together. Are you kidding me? This is like uh, it's such a it's such a beautiful, beautiful piece. Now, do you where did you grow up in the DMV again? So when we first got here, we came right to Anacostia. 
And, um, and I used to, to ride the bus every day as a very young girl into Northwest because my mom went to Har Howard University. Um, so I was going every day to Northwest and, and I'm traumatized by riding buses because I was way too little. And if you, if you go to Georgia Avenue um, in seven, <laughs> you know, Georgia and Florida when they, they cross, yeah, it looks really like I can't believe what it looks like now. But what it looked like back in the day, it was rough. And I would be like <laughs> me and my little brother, <laughs> we would just be there. Like if you didn't catch the bus, you had to wait 45 minutes on that in that intersection. It was it was that's rough. It was, it was rough. We had to do what we had to do. Mom said to do what she had to do. And it all worked out. But I, I have a, I have feelings about riding buses. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh no, from the D from DC. Ooh. Um, My mom tapped me on the back and said, You were just too young. I'm really proud of you. You did it. Like, you don't have to hold busy. that anymore. <laughs> I actually we should drop in the chat, sweet honey in the rock, for folks to go check out your mom's work and that you know, Google that shit. That music is gorgeous. Um, I want to tell you, we love listening to your podcast with Adrian Marie Brown, um, Octavia's Parables. And I would love um, to know how that project came about. And um, yeah, yeah. How, what's that been like? Uh, Adrian, Adrian did that. Adrian was like, we should do a podcast together. And she was like, what if we read every chapter of Octavia's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talent, like do the parables? and maybe even get our, our hands on the third one that wasn't um, finished. And, and I was said yes right away. Um, it's been such a powerful experience because we both you know, end up reading the chapters again. And it's, we've each probably read these books like a hundred times and I'm still learning from them. So it's been great. And That's the reception awesome. has been amazing. Thank you everyone who keeps tuning in. Yeah, we should drop that also in the in the chat for your um, so you get more listeners. That would be that really would be good. great. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good. Um, I just keep thinking also about you have you've done so many things in your career. Like you are um, like what I was saying before. It's just not just like not just you know producer, curator, artist, composer. Is it? Like, can you talk a little bit about sort of like, it's not like switching hats. We already talked about like, you can't compartmentalize, you know, you're all one being, it's one container and stuff. But can you talk about all those different aspects of your, your career and what's that been like to juggle that? Sure. I mean, I really wanted to play sports first and oh, I no had a, a, yeah, I wanted Would to be the first. Play? Football, I wanted to be the first woman in the NFL. Like I've been boycotting the NFL for like eight years now. So it's like, <laughs> but I, I was like, I'm going to be the first woman football player in the NFL. Um, but I had a, I had a sports injury, like playing baseball uh -huh. on a concrete and when I was like 12 mm -hmm. and the end result is like two years later, they were like, you're not running anymore. So since I was a kid, I haven't been able to run and um, I've had all of these surgeries on my hip. Um, but when I, when the doctor, when we were in a doctor's office and the doctor was like, you can't run, I just turned and looked at my mom and I was like, I'll be a musician. And it was, it was that quick. I'll be a musician. And she was like, okay. <laughs> you know, and you when played we were in the music? car, had was, you played guitar at that point and you played, I mean, all? I was musical, but it yeah, was definitely like the behind sports. So like I had figured out a little bit how to play the drums and I had like, you know, started noodling on the guitar a little bit and had my best friend, Danny Lopez and I, we would be like, you know, teaching each other Neil Young songs over the phone, you know, just, I, I you know, I was kind of in that, but I was just like, I'm going to be, you know, the, this football player. And, um, and, you know, she told me to learn how to be a producer. She was like, you know, do sing. She said, stay away from drugs and learn how to be a producer. And she's like, learn how to produce your own shows, produce records, produce everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it was through that, that I, I, so I ended up producing my first concert. And oh, no yeah, 17 years old, and it was at my school and I charged two bucks. And <laughs> it was packed, y'all. It was packed, it was packed, it was packed. <laughs> and I was like, it was amazing. Um, and since then, I kind of been a part of producing myself and everything I've done is, you know, you're now working with me and I have multiple hats on this production. 
I'm like, you know, I'm in the show. Um, I'm a music director of the show. I'm a composer. Um, and I'm also the person that like, along with um, Tommy who books the show, I show up right almost as soon as he does. And sometimes I'm before the show is, is booked because I'm the person who said, introduces the piece to the presenters who want to present it. Mm -hmm. And then I have a personal relationship with everybody who presents this show. Like you, people become like people and it's something we're working on together. And, um, and it is, it, it's so impactful to really understand um, how people do their jobs, what their innovation is. I'm moved and, and I learned so much from them, but I, I do, I just, I just, am like, oh, this, this can be, I can be an institution of, in myself and I can like center my work and the things that are important to me. You know, it's important to me to have a generational, um, uh, you know, tribe. I, I try to like, you know, every time I get a little bit older, I'm like, is there somebody at least 10 years younger than me, um, like annoying me? And, <laughs> you know, like, cause basically that's how you get, that's how you, you know, operate with somebody younger than you that's very smart and starts to push you around a little bit and start to change, you know, what you think and, and how you do things. That's the greatest gift of all. And you have to let them have you, you know? So I, I, I really love that. I love working. Um, I have now relationships with a lot of actors, actresses, musicians, dancers, presenters for over 20, 25 years of the yeah, right. beautiful, exciting thing about getting older is getting wealthier in your relationships. Oh my God. My people are unbelievable. So I, I <laughs> it's always like, you know, don't make me start talking about people. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So I even uh -huh. notice it just in our, in, in the conversations leading up to this and in the conversation leading up to parable coming and stuff, it's just, it feels so different, Toshi. You just have, a, a, it, you center those relationships in this. And so much of, um, particularly in the presenting world, like, you know, there are these conferences where you go and like, you go to book shows and you see a show and you're like shopping for a show. And it's so weird to me because it's like, it's, it's, it's so, it's like you're shopping for art in some way. And like, where is that human connection? And how do you, how, how do you get that and feel that particularly mm -hmm. if you're, you know, to me, it's like, I, I feel so lucky to be, to, to invite you to be here in my home. And like, I want to make sure that you feel like, you know, the queen, right. <laughs> it's like, that's what, I, that's what I want, you know? Um, and so I even noticed that in the way that you're sort of, um, uh, how uh, intentional actually all of the conversations are and how we don't make any sort of assumptions about how something's going to be or how something's going to go because mm. it's, it's very emergent you're in that emergent strategy book <laughs> <laughs> I am I mean it's because there's so much to learn from everybody and, and it's not that I can learn everything but I truly believe every single person you know, has their own genius, has their own gifts. And, it, and when I say that, it doesn't mean like, oh, it's something nobody else can do. Or it's something, it's, it's just that your you um, is special and, and wonderful in some particular way that nobody else is. And I'm always so moved when people show me that. And theater is a great world for that. Like, you know, I, I meet everybody. I meet the like, tech people. I meet like, you know. You're the box office people become your best friends, right? I love box office people. I'm like, can I be put on the ticket thing? Can you, can, can I get the ma email? And they're like, no. And I'm like, please. And I always get it, you know, <laughs> like, I always get it. I want to know, you know, how the tickets are doing. I want to know everything. <laughs> um, Cause I want the most people to be in a room together. And I want the most I want the most representation of the community that I'm in. And so I, I want the show to be available in a way that the whole community, if they want to, could be a part of the room, you know? And that's, that's the dreamiest, most amazing thing about Parable is how much we have been able to like put in a, a circle, a representation of so many of the communities that we're in. And, um, and I would say University of North Carolina is kind of 
where at um, Carolina Performing Arts is where I kind of learned, oh, if you make a path, you make you you actually center the community and how the community wants to be approached about about work and how and then you invite them into your space and then you you do what you're gonna do and um, and then when you do that show you you gotta stay with the community you can't be like we did the show like no you and then maybe you come back again and the show is different because now the community actually knows who you are and has some wants some say in what's gonna happen. Like that's the most amazing thing to me. Well, so this is, you know, you were talking about sustainability. We were talking about it, about sort of a level, and that's a theme actually in the show to in the show and in the books, this sort of how how folks need to continue whatever daily activation they're making. And I feel like right now, I mean, again, like acknowledging the moment that we're in, we're X days out from the election, we're this and that and whatever, and sort of what happens after that or what happens and life does continue. So what what does what does that kind of daily activation, that sustainability, that kind of stuff, that that relationship with the community, what does that look like for you? I mean, first of all, I just want to say to everybody, you deserve better. Like you deserve better. Like you're you're awesome. <laughs> like you're amazing. And I'm just gonna assume everybody here is 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 incredible and you deserve better. Like this is this is horrible. Like this is we should not we should not swallow this. Like somebody's trying to feed us, we should reject it. We should cover our mouths, like we should turn our heads, we should throw shit off the table, you know, we should, we should refuse, we should refuse it in every way we can. It, it, it is, it is an incredible abuse. Hmm. It's an incredible abuse. It's so abusive. I, I am like, I be, I, I get even sadder from my ancestors because I understand that this particular tyranny is the tyranny of the founding fathers who created this country and thought it's okay to um, create a path of violence and genocide on the rightful tribes of this land, who the first people of this land to kidnap people from Africa, from multiple countries in Africa, start the transatlantic slave trade that, that happened for hundreds of years. When I go and do Black History Month shows for children of any race, any children, and you try to explain like how long that is. And I ask them, how long is five years? How long is 50 years? And, mm -hmm. and they'll be like, like, you know this, and like how long is a hundred years? Yeah, hey, you know, 200 years, hey, you know, 300 years. I mean, I, I'm like, what do you think it is? And they'll be holding hands and they'll be trying, 400 years, ah, 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 it's too much. And the fact that there was innovation and specific, specific, specific um, pushbacks meeting innovation against a diabolical system that created every, every institutional, process of running this country and that the descendants and the descendants and the descendants of the descendants basically are like, well, we can stay here. And the country is like, well, if you're going to be here, we're going to figure out how many ways we can abuse you. And I think like when you, you know, when you look at the people and, and it becomes common, like, well, of course, black people would be treated this way because look at their issues and of course, like young, like black men should be treated this way. Look at they look at with women, and then you, but then you're like, oh, but look at you know the the indigenous tribes of this land and their descendants and the people who said, well, well, shouldn't they get their land back? Oh no, they shouldn't. It's been so long. Why should they? Then when you think about the planet itself, just the planet, the water, we have to accept that what comes with leading this country politically is a lot of power to follow in the footsteps of what was there before. And it takes 
really strong and creative people to reject that because it's literally handed to you. Yeah, right. And it's what the we're default. Yeah, and what we're witnessing is is someone who's picked that up and run with it. And it's not just this person, it's an entire, you know, forget about Republican and Democrats, like just forget it. It's just like, make you mad, make you mad, make you mad. <laughs> Who is liberal? Who you know, is conservative? Right? You're from DC, you should know. It's just, it's this bullshit, okay? <laughs> you just say that. And we're like running around having debates. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Honey, do you want to drink water tomorrow? <laughs> These are the questions you just need to ask yourself. Honey, do you want to sleep in peace at night? <laughs> this is it. You know, honey, do you want your kids to play outside? Like, we need to just get it to basics. So you deserve better than what you're getting. And the fact that this person has blood, this whole administration has decided to let COVID wreck because we learn every time there's a disaster um, and people die and people lose homes, this whole other thing sweeps in behind them, talk to people in NOLA, sweeps in behind them, talk about Black Wall Street, sweeps in behind them and takes all the stuff and then runs it the way they want. So that's what this is about, except for it's a move for the entire country. So I want everybody to really think about this election like it's part of, of something. It's not the something. It is part of something. And it is an opportunity for you to actually push back and correct course. But it is not the change that you want it to be. Too much has already happened. Too much is already seeded. And you need to think of this as one thing. No matter who wins. And people really hate that I'm saying this. But no matter who wins, the level that you're operating on now will stay the same or higher. Even if it's Biden and Harris, it doesn't matter. We will have an one or two years to push, 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 and shift this. And it doesn't matter who's in the office. It's better if Biden and Harris are in the office. So please vote for Biden and Harris. But if this other person gets up in there, let me tell you, Let's get it together. Let's get it together. You can, you, can get have a, you can have a minute, you know, and be like, oh my God. And then after that, let's get it together. Let's get it together. Yeah, no, it's going to, this is why I wanted to start and frame the conversation with this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. This doesn't end on November 4th. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do together. Um, okay, so we're at the lightning round, my friend. Uh, you okay. ready for it? I'm totally ready for it. Amazing. Okay, good. So what you reading? I'm reading Alexis DeVoe's book, Yavo, Y-A-V-O. This book is fire. It's <laughs> fire. People right now go and get this book. I've never read a book like in 10 pages. I'm just like, oh, 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 oh. And it's amazing. It's so good. Oh, she's such a genius. And I got to say, shout out my bestie, Jacqueline Woodson, has this um, wonderful book for young people called Before the Ever After. And it's a football story. So I was kind of her football consultant. It is, it is, it is, it's, oh, your heart. So I've read that already, but I kind of like, let me shout her out. That's Rock and roll. What about, uh, what are you watching? I'm watching a lot of Korean dramas. I am just. <laughs> is that like coming up on Netflix for you? It's everywhere, you know, there's, you can watch Korean dramas are everywhere. They're like on Netflix, they're on Hulu, they're, they're everywhere. Korean dramas, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that I need a, I need to go in a completely different Direction. area. Like it's literally yeah. not a part of my life at all for television and, and movies and stuff. I just need, I need something that's just all the way over there. So Korean dramas, I'm like, do you knows. have one that you want to sort of specifically say that if you're going to start with the Korean dramas, we should go there? Uh, not really. So you just, there's so many of them. I mean, it's such an industry. The first one I watched was called The Coffee Prince. And I, and I watched it by, by accident because I, I don't love like, you know, I like looking at what other countries are doing. So, you know, um, I watch a lot of Indian cin cinema as well. Um, so like, I love the old Bollywood movies and oh, they're you know, awesome. Yeah. So I, you know, you, you just kind of Google around and you just decide what you like. If you like pretty boys, 
then you're gonna like, there's just a whole genre around pretty boys, like flower boys. And then if you want, like, you have to really look to find some progressiveness around like oh, women characters and stuff. Like it, it, it has its certain thing. It just might, might not be for everybody, but you know, I really That's what you're, yeah, but it's yeah. it is for you. So what are you listening to? Uh, I am listening to like, I had to write a list so I wouldn't forget, but I love Black Coffee, DJ Black Coffee. He's not oh, yeah. really DJ, but he's out from South, um, South Africa. He does a lot of co collaborations with other uh, singers. He does, I, that's been my mainstay. Like usually my morning starts with, with Black Coffee. Um, Laura and Vula, uh, my beautiful friend from London. Oh my God, I have to listen to her really, really often. And then I just got to big up the, the DJs, like, you know, my homie DJ Remarkable, who's been going on, you know, um, getting a lot of blues from Instagram and everybody who's like kind of shutting down. But Remarkable is amazing. And um, one time I just said to her, what about a gospel house mix? And she did one um, online and it was fire. Uh, DJs are really keeping us up. Oh yeah, they are. No, for sure. That's like a dance party for me basically every week. That's how I, how I let it all out. Um, who are you following on social media and stuff? Are you on social? Yeah, I am. I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, and like I got a Twitter thing, but I just need help with Twitter. I've just never been a tweeter. Um, I'm following Alexis Pauline Gums. I, Alexis Pauline Gums is a brilliant, like, I recommend her to everybody and Facebook. I put her in Facebook first. So I'm pretty much guaranteed to see a smile like you wouldn't believe and learn something really good and, or see her process. So she is, she is, she is a, a writer. She's a poet. She's a, she's Dr. Paul, you know, <laughs> Alexis Pauline Gums. Um, she's, she's, a, I don't know. She just, she be thinking about everything. But she had, um, she was writing every day, like uh, last year, this marine mammal meditation. And it would be like taking um, a story that was about a particular, you know, kind of mammal and its journey, and its journey often intersected with us in some oh, way, wow. Wow. and then became uh, relatable to something that either happened personally in her life or that happened to us. And I read these things, like I was like running to them, like, when, did she put it out yet? And, um, and then I called her and said, can I, would you, can you, can, I wanna hear you read these. And so we recorded actually 10 of them. She said, yes, which I'm amazed with. Um, and so slowly over the next period of time, um, we'll be releasing these meditations. They haven't but, come out yet, right? No, not yet, but she, her book of the meditations is called Undrowned. I ordered it, I haven't read it. Um, she's an extraordinary person. I, I, I follow her and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, how sometimes people are extraordinary and they're just, they're just like, you know, I don't know. It's almost like it's a big sign and hers is like, like, she's like, if you, if we had a community, she might be like the root woman, but the root woman who also was a poet and also mm -hmm could like, you know, write a forward to your book and also could teach a class. <laughs> it's also, I mean, and, and also, and also, and also, she, she's amazing. Yeah, she sounds it. She sounds it. She said, thank you for that. I didn't know her. So I got to go get that book too. And I can't wait for those meditations. That sounds amazing and exactly yeah. what I need. Um, okay, so last question. What is one life-changing thing you've learned so far in 2020? Wow. Okay. I thought about this a lot and I have to tell you, it's that blah, blah, blah matters. It's that like, you know how you can be moving through your day and you, you just don't realize, like I would talk about is special gifts that I know everybody has, mm -hmm. but maybe people are really could doubt their, what they know about functioning. And maybe they think, what 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 they're special at isn't like something that is expandable or something that doesn't like actually have a relationship to anybody else. But if this one thing this year has taught me is that that's that's it's that's not true. Like it matters if you're a doctor or a nurse and you had to navigate like what you know on such an incredible level 
and innovate and that you, you know, and, and that it matters that somebody saw that this was a problem and then said, hey, what if we can make these gowns for the doctors and whatever. It, it matters that people started on corners like refrigerator. Here's a refrigerator on a street. People put it, food in it, people come and get it. It matters that people work so hard to keep their stores open. It works, families potted together and we're like, and you can think it's going on so long, like, is it ridiculous? No, it matters so much. Mm -hmm. It matters that you care. It matters that you showed up. It matters that, um, you know, you, you checked in on somebody and you let six months pass by and you didn't talk to your friend. But then today you were like, that's the day. It matters that you did that. It's just your goodness, your half-ass attempt to try to do something. It just, it, all of it matters. It really does. And I think we will all get a lot of opportunities to be, be told or to be made to feel like it doesn't matter. But if you think about the territory we're in, hmm. you know, if you think about that, the, that the challenge of oppression that we're in is to actually make you doubt yourself and be afraid. You could puff up your chest right now and say, no, it matters who I am. It matters what I did. And it matters that I care. And it is, if it's this big or if it's this big, yeah. it just, it all matters. All of us matter together. So that's what I learned. I guess so many good things have happened to me when I've been, been okay. And when I've been weary because somebody was like, yo, what's up? Like, what's yeah. going on? Can I help you with this? Whatever. It matters. It matters. 2020. <laughs> and I will, and obviously Black Lives Matter. So <laughs> no question. No question yes. about that. No. So where can people find you online? What's your website? Okay, I'm toshiregan.com and I'm also I'm on Facebook and my regular Facebook page is I is public. It's always been public. I don't mm -hmm. need to be your friend if unless you're just like I really need that reward. I just make it pu public. I also have Toshi Regan and Big Lovely page and I have a parable opera page and the same thing on Instagram. I'm Toshi Regan or Big Lovely 101. And then there's a parable opera Instagram. Um, I'm around. Yeah. And you wanted to plug something? This is the moment to do so. Oh, okay. Here I go. I'm going to plug. So um, I am at CAP UCLA on October 30th and 31st for their incredible Tune In Festival. So just go cap ucla.edu, something like that. It's all over my social media. Um, on October 30th, I am doing a call and response, Black Lives Matter, Q&A for young people. I'm with all of these artists, I'm, I'm all these authors. I'm the only one that hasn't written a book. I'm with Jacqueline Woodson and Jason Reynolds and oh, Kwame wow. Alexander. Oh, wow. And let a Neely. It's like a pile. And kids ask questions and we answer them. And kids are brilliant. Like yeah. these questions are incredible. And then uh, that's at 6 30. And you go to Arts Emerson for that. Arts Emerson is, is working with us on that. And then on November 4th, I cannot wait. I will be doing a live show from Joe's Pub at 7 p.m. <laughs> the post election show, no matter what. So if I don't know what's going to happen, but come on November 7th, November 4th at 7 p.m. Amazing. I, I'm so glad you brought up Joe's Pub. Hooray, Shanta Thake. Hooray, Alex Knowlton. Hooray, everybody there. We love you so much. Um, yeah. And thank, uh, yeah, I know. There's so much love. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time tonight, Toshi. It was really, really wonderful to share this virtual space with you. Thank you so much. Yay. All right, rock and roll. Take care, everybody.